Okay, and welcome everybody. Welcome to the uh, 17th edition of CIO Next. My name is Hendrik Deckers. I'm the founder of uh, CIONet, and it's my pleasure and my privilege to uh, welcome you all. We're going to have a, a, a great 90 minutes together where we are going to discuss digital innovation with Arlene Buller from DB Cargo, with Katrina Campbell from uh, EY, with Artie Dubedin from KBN, and with uh, Daniel Poor from UiPod. So that's the topic of today digital innovation, and more specifically, we're going to dive in on how we can use AI for digital innovation and how we can use uh, automation and RPA for um, uh, innovation. Uh, I've got a couple of announcements uh, before we get started. First of all, I would like to thank UiPod, who is the, uh, the sponsor of the conference and, of course, who is also one of the leading software companies in the domain of uh, RPA and, uh, and business process automation. So thank you, uh, UiPath, for um, this uh, wonderful collaboration that we have here today. The panelists that we have here, uh, Arlene, Katrina, and Arti, I have visited uh, all three ladies in uh, Mainz, in London, and in Rotterdam, and we had a sit down for more than an hour uh, where we discussed not only the, uh, the digital innovation, AI, and RPA, but also their leadership style, their personality characteristics. So we did deep dive uh, interviews with, uh, uh, with On CIONet uh, TV, we have the videos of Arlene, Katrina, and Arti that, uh, that have gone uh, live already for Arlene and Katrina, and for Arti that's going to go live next week. Now, on CIONet.tv and our, on our YouTube channel, you not only find these three videos, but you find more than 100 leadership deep dives with digital leaders from around Europe. And, uh, and two that we have uh, recently uh, done was with Geert Goethals and with Ashield Hanna Larsen. Uh, and I just wanted to uh, announce again that last week we have awarded Ashield Hanna Larsen European Digital Leader of the Year 2023 as being the most transformational digital leader uh, of the year. And Ashield is, of course, uh, one of the uh, VPs at Equinor, the old uh, stat oil. Uh, so the wonderful work that she's been doing, and also her video is available on CIONet TV. Uh, another one that you find there is that one of uh, Geert Goethals, former CIO of Proximus, and he has been awarded most inspirational European Digital Leader of the Year. So these videos, together with more than 100 videos, can be found on uh, CIONet.tv. Another thing that we are very proud of and that uh, we were, uh, put in a lot of effort is in the creation of our cookbooks. And so we have just recently launched the second edition of the CIONet cookbook. And, uh, uh, and, and of course, Arti and Arlene and Katrina are very, uh, uh, very warm, welcome and invited to, uh, to bring their uh, uh, recipe for digital success in the next edition. So if all go well, that will be featured in the next edition of our cookbook as well. Uh, so in the CRNet cookbook, you find more than 20 uh, recipes for digital success combined with some real cooking recipes uh, as well. And so if you are uh, a CRNet member, go to crnet.com slash cook and you can get your free uh, online copy or your free paper copy if you want. If, uh, if you're not a CRNet member, you can go to the same page uh, and download the ebook, or you can go to uh, uh, Amazon, where it has been uh, awarded um, uh, as one of the uh, um, uh, best launching books, business books in this category uh, last week. So get your copy of the CIONet cookbook, uh, I would say. 
Last announcement before we start our conversation is that uh, for your agendas, if you're a CIONET member on the 30th of May, we're going to do a co-design, European co-design uh, session together with uh, Fujitsu, uh, with uh, Kasia Borowska from Brainpool, with Bern Dattler from Asfinach and Udo Wurz from um, uh, Fujitsu, where we're going to talk about practical opportunities with AI. And so where we're going to look at, well, AI strategy. Uh, and so uh, if you're a Sierra member on the 30th of May, you want to participate in this very interactive co-design session, go to link.sierra.com, uh, register slash register AI, and you're very warm welcome uh, to, uh, to join the group here. So that's uh, for uh, your agendas. And with that, we have our uh, introductions and announcements out of the way. And I'm going to bring in everybody here in the panel with us uh, today. And, and so it's really a big pleasure uh, to, uh, to welcome uh, everybody in, this, uh, uh, in the conference here today. So let me organize uh, the, uh, uh, everybody here. So we have Katrina, Arti, Arlene, Daniel, uh, a wonderful panel, three top uh, uh, digital leaders in the, on the on-demand the side, and Daniel will introduce himself, has a lot of experience both on, on demand and, and supply uh, side. And so what I suggest is that we start with introductions. And so my question is, maybe Katrina, you want to go first. Could you please introduce yourself? Who are you? Uh, what's your, where do you work? Tell us a little bit about your organization, your function. And then uh, tell us what is for you the most important challenge that, that EY and, the, and, and your industry is facing today? Thanks, Hendrik. Um, and um, thank you for putting me first. <laughs> um, well, um, my my name is Katrina Campbell, as Hendrik said. Um, the it's pronounced Katrina, as uh, spelt with an O in it, uh, and that's because I'm Scottish. It's Scottish for Catherine. Um, my role at EY is I'm the CTIO, so I'm in charge of technology and innovation for EY for the UK and Ireland. So a little bit about EY. So EY is uh, is the brand Ernst and Young. Um, EY has 360,000 people globally, 30,000 in the UK and Ireland. And if you caught the preview video that was on, we do a number of services for clients around the world in a huge amount of markets um, and sectors. And, and what we do is we do taxation services. It sounds boring, but it's absolutely fascinating. Um, we do strategy and transaction services. So we help organizations buy or, or build better. Um, we also look after audit and assurance for, for clients and we look after consulting services. Now consulting services includes risk consulting, which I'll talk about later on when I talk about AI. It's technology services, it's HR, kind of people services and things like operations supply chain services. So we're a big, big consulting and audit company all over the world. Um, my role specifically within that is to help organizations uh, be better served through the provision of technology. So when I say the provision of technology, what we'll do is we'll design products and services that are technology led. So for instance, the provision of taxation services, we can provide a taxation platform that's connected into all the major government taxation services to help you a tax leader do your job better. We also, however, create services for us internally. So what my team does is it um, understands what the new and next productivity savings are, services to, to help our clients better that our, our staff need to do, and we'll design and build those. And that's the part of my job that innovation comes into. And that's the bit that gets me really excited because as Hendrik knows, I've been working in technology innovation for the last 25 years. In fact, the reason I'm at EY is because I stood up a technology innovation agency grew it to multiple countries and sold it to EY in 2015, which is why I'm here looking after innovation and technology, because I like to say I've been there and done that. So, so that's me in a nutshell. Now, you said, Hendrik, at the end, you wanted to understand what our biggest challenge was. I think our biggest challenge is probably something that resonates with everyone on the call, and that's the world is getting more complex. The technology ecosystem is absolutely vast. 
there are a plethora of software providers, cloud providers, hardware providers, and really navigating that technology ecosystem is something that I'm tasked with here in UK and Ireland to do for our board, but also equally helping our clients navigate and manage their technology ecosystem. And one of the greatest transformation disruptors recently, AI. Um, and um, I'm very fortunate to be able to, to help the business with some of their AI challenges. And so I see that, Hendrik, as our biggest challenge and that for our clients, that ecosystem orchestration, the difficulty with it being just so complex to do transformation nowadays, ensuring human-centered design is in, in, embedded in all of those things that we do. Okay, super. Thank you so much, uh, Katrina, for that uh, introduction and for uh, learning us how to pronounce your beautiful Scottish name. <laughs> Thanks, Hendrik. So, Arlene, why don't you go next and, uh, and tell us a little bit more about yourself, your organization, and the challenges that you're facing today. Thank you, Hendrik. Very happy to be here. My name is Arlene Bueller, and I'm the CEO and CDO of DB Cargo. DB Cargo is a 100% subsidiary of uh, Germany's biggest aid company, German Railway, Deutsche Bahn. And we are the biggest rail freight company in all of Europe. We're operating in 17 European countries and in China. And uh, we have the big mission to actively um, work every day to um, reduce CO2 emissions. So in numbers, we do save 7 million um, tons every year compared to the road traffic, the truck business. So we see that um, kind of like like a partnership because we're also looking into intermodal and how we can also leverage um, in general all of the freight traffic in, in all of Europe and by that also actively help to um, tackle climate change. So we have a huge um, uh, purpose and sustainability agenda that we are working on every day. And with that comes also the biggest challenge because obviously uh, the tracks are very limited. In Germany alone, we have um, 30,000 kilometers. That is nothing compared to, to the, the vast uh, road system. And our biggest challenge here is capacity management. So we cannot build more tracks because in dense communities, if you tell someone, okay, we're building a track that first of all takes um, decades, 20, 30 years, and obviously, when their house is built, it's very, very difficult to find still free space to actually build more tracks. So our answer is um, capacity management and uh, by using uh, automation and innovation. And that is where my role comes very much into place with an organization that we have in Germany, um, around about um, 250 plus or close to 300 externals. But in general, at, at DB Cargo, we have more than uh, eight, 900 um, IT professionals that are helping us with this mission is to really see how we can find partnerships and ecosystem on how to create much more innovation in this in this um, railway sector to to being able to shift more um, traffic from from road to rail and this is what we are all very passionate about and very excited about and, and I'm very glad that we have an opportunity today to talk a little bit about that. Yeah, well, what I remember from our interview, uh, Arlene, is that how many one train equals to how many uh, uh, Lastkraftwagen, uh, how many uh, tr um, big lorries? Yeah, so if you look at one full uh, block train that uh, accounts to almost 740 meters, we can replace with one block train 52 uh, trucks. So the magnitude is, is quite big that we have. 52 trucks. So, I mean, uh, and, and sustainability being such an important uh, topic, uh, a, a train transport both for people and for freight is, uh, is a very important uh, um, well, way to, uh, to, uh, to um, work on our sustainability and, and logistics, I would say. So thank you so much for that, Arlene. Arti, let's, uh, let's go to you. So could you please uh, explain who you are, what your role is today, and tell us a little bit more about KPN and the, big ch the biggest challenge that you're facing today. Thank you. Of course, my name is Artie Davidin. I am CIO, Consumer Wholesale and Enterprise. This means that um, I serve all of the 
consumers in the Netherlands, uh, consumers for KPN and via wholesale clients, also the consumers or clients cross-border and the total enterprise. Uh, KPN is historically the largest, the biggest, the best, and also uh, the most relevant telecommunication provider in the Netherlands. Um, and communications has been, uh, has grown so much in their purpose and uh, and position in the market space that means that we really need now to utilize our our, our position here um, we've seen uh, sitting all front row front and center row during the pandemic how important it is to have connectivity speed of connectivity and leverage connectivity uh, from communication service providers we've also seen that if everything traditional communications is not available how we need uh, that whole uh, end-to-end uh, high-speed connectivity that's grew in all of our daily lives uh, also professional and also in our private lives, um, how important that is. All of the value creation before the pandemic that we've seen um, being lost to us and gained by tech players, uh, now is an opportunity for telco players to get back at this again. This also means that we have to move up the ladder and also orchestrate those ecosystems to design digital use cases on top. Uh, and and that's a really challenging and super nice position to be in because we really have to make that transition uh, from a communication service provider to a value creator by utilizing that technology uh, and those um, uh, connectivities and ne the network and also try to, uh, in this case, leverage the a vast amount of data that we have and the massive customer, uh, customer relationships and uh, data uh, that we already have with us. Yeah, you, I mean, you work in, in, a, in a fascinating environment, I think. Uh, telco companies being high-tech companies that are being, are being disrupted by so many. Everybody tries to disrupt your organization and you need to constantly reinvent yourself at new services Technology is changing so far so from 3, 4, 5G, and so on as so one fiber. There's, there's new things. It's very asset heavy as well. Huge amounts of, of, of investments going in there. So that must be a, a, a great environment to, uh, uh, to work in. Uh, so thank yeah, you and for don't forget about TV and OTT, yeah. how that the last couple of years played such a huge role. Yeah. Uh, so TV, OTT, and the combination of all these services. Yes, definitely. Okay, so we've got a telco company that is under constant uh, reinvention. We've got a very traditional railways that needs to uh, automate and digitize. We've got a services organization, so three completely different uh, sectors. And Daniel, um, let's talk about software companies. I mean, uh, please introduce yourself and, 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 uh, and your organization and your role in the organization. And how do you see the, uh, the challenges that, that you're facing today? Sure. So uh, good day to all of you. It's just really an honor to be on this panel with such distinguished guests. Um, so I'm Daniel Poor. I'm uh, a leader of the strategy and value practice inside UiPath. Uh, UiPath is the industry leader in robotic process automation and the business application uh, automation platform. Um, we've been the leaders in the magic quadrant for years. And uh, that's a we call it intelligent automation, the combination of RPA and AI combined uh, that is a complement to your core systems of record transactional systems. Um, my role and my team's role in our organization is to help our customers achieve board relevant value using our technology. Um, it's as simple as that. Yeah. Uh, software's, you know, use old school metaphor. It's a CD on the shelf until you do something with it uh, okay. using organizations like EY to excellently understand what the business problem is and figure out what the right technology is to deliver relevant and uh, meaningful business value. 
Uh, and, and you're joining us from, from Seattle this morning. I'm from Seattle. So <laughs> Very if, early in the morning there, right? If every other word doesn't come out right, please forgive me. That's because I'm only one cup of coffee in. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, uh, the challenges, I'm really going to emphasize what Katrina said, is that the technology complexity, where we started with uh, um, all in one, and then it was best of breed, and then it evolved back to single source. And now we're with APIs in the cloud, we're back in a hyper version of best in breed, that kind of technology complexity. I want to add another one to it that I'm seeing, and that is the world is truly spinning faster. The rate of change, uh, I was writing something yesterday, if you think about what's happened in the last two years since March 2020, We've had a global pandemic. We've had a labor shortage. We've had supply chain disruptions. We've had a, a, a war with global implications. We have a geostrategic conflict that is a new Cold War. And in the United States, we've had a, a round of bank failures and interest rate increases. That's all in two years. So um, I think the, the faster goes with complex to make things uh, uniquely different now. Well, as they say, may you live in interesting times. That's, I, I'm, I'm sure that we're living them right now, no? That's right. And so I, uh, I think what we're seeing is, you know, the, the, the old cliche is the Chinese character uh, is, you know, for a problem is, is risk and opportunity. Um, and I probably mangled that definition. But I think we're seeing exactly that, right? Is that on, on the one hand for organizations, uh, there are innovation opportunities with new technology to fundamentally transform the way work is done, uh, uh, what businesses they're in, what markets they're serving, and how they serve them. On the other hand, those windows of opportunity open and close much faster now. And uh, so our job is, my job and my team's job is to help our customers understand the, those opportunities and the competitive advantage that they can uh, seize, but then seize it before the laggards and the pack comes along. And then this becomes a commodity, effectively cost of doing business requirement. Okay. So ladies and gentlemen, we're going to discuss digital innovation. We're going to discuss um, AI, and we're going to discuss um, uh, intelligent automation, RPA and how AI and, and RPA can use, be used for, uh, for innovation. And, uh, and Daniel, I've, I've given you some homework and, uh, sure. and, and that was to, uh, to come up with a kind of a, a short introduction to, uh, to paint a little bit of context on, on how we can look at, at innovation, at digital, and where we are in, 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 in history and, uh, and what are really the, um, the, the changes that we are witnessing today. So if you could paint the picture and then we'll go to our link, Katrina and Arti, on how they look at uh, and, and what examples that they have of innovation in their organizations. Great, so thank you for that. Um, I'm gonna start because we consultants love to trot around a whole bunch of vague terms. I'm gonna start with some definitions and hopefully the panel will see them as usable and serviceable. So for me, uh, digital, Digital is using digital technologies pervasively across the enterprise. Uh, that's going to fundamentally change how work is done and really how value is delivered. Um, I, I see three generations of digital. It started in the 90s and the aughts with the rollout of core transactional systems, ERPs, CRMs, and the like. That was really all about developing canonical business processes, largely to secure data and have a single source of data as necessary, not very exciting, not really value adding in any material sense, but necessary. The second wave happened about mid 2000 and teens, 2015, when RPA came onto the scene. Uh, what that did was allow an, a complementary overlay to the core canonical processes that did order to cash, procure to pay and the like However, it did it in a very rigid, slow, and, and uh, expensive way. What RPA did is a complement, is a much faster, I call it a fast twitch muscle, uh, for being able to do the last mile, the edges of a process where there are legitimate business differences between how business unit one and two, or geography A and B, do things 
that there's just frankly not enough time or money in your ERP budget to solve those problems. So RPA was that complement. And now I see we're in the third generation, the exciting and a little bit scary one was when you add artificial intelligence onto that. Because all of a sudden you have uh, cognitive capabilities at a scale none of us have ever envisioned 10 years ago available to any organization to take the benefits of this complementary core transactional system and RPA movement of data and execution on direction. But now you have um, a, a truly huge computational brain power uh, to help uh, decide next best action, uh, identify uh, categories, extract meaning, um, see patterns that uh, human beings could do if there were enough time enough Excel and enough R. And sometimes in some cases, even a bunch of human beings couldn't do it because there's never enough time. So that third generation of coupling cognitive AI and machine learning with the core process technology, that's my definition of digital. I think that leads to three disruptions. And forgive me, disruptions is sort of this term that we all trot around. Um, I think Trina said it best in her early interview is that this is such a sea change on the order of magnitude of the internet arriving. I completely agree with that. So if you'll forgive me for using the term disruption, I think it's right. I see four changes. First, how processes are designed and enabled, sort of simple, right? The, the how, where, when, why, and even who, a human or a machine makes decisions in an organization now. That implies really, so what do humans do for work? and how is value created is gonna be fundamentally different in the coming years. And that really leads to the last one, the one I'm most interested in, in my background is uh, from my doctoral work is how organizational cultures have to change. The very DNA of the organization needs to change to take advantage of the fact that this non-value added work, these opportunities for error and these cycle time delays are going away. And so um, how are organizations gonna change so that their culture is adapted to the new problem solving and creativity needs? Um, that is, I think implied in that is the innovation potential. And I would, um, I would, it would be immodest of me to try to tell you where the innovation is coming because I don't know yet. I'm hoping my panel will help us. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Daniel, for that uh, introduction. And so now I open up the uh, the, the panel to the uh, to the three CIOs here today. So so what's what's your reaction if you have this this introduction with Daniel Han? How do how do you look at digital innovation in in, in your organizations um, today? Who wants to take it away? Oh, can I can, can I respond to uh, Daniel? Sorry, Catriona, because I, I made some notes. It's super interesting that you're uh, really framing those four uh, intentions or uh, disruptions. So processes, the what, where, and how, and who is going to do uh, the work. Um, making a distinction between. Uh, value add and maybe less or non-value add activities. These are all, I think, uh, there for decades and decades. But we more and more moving forward uh, see the complexity of your fourth uh, mention, and that's how cultures and organizations need to change. And that's so much... Um, uh, more complex because it's not just uh, it's net technology I would want to start a debate that technology is never the problem it's always a solution but um, organizations changing organizations cultures and or the way we see change and how we can build organizations and styles and how, how we collaborate to moving into that change and open mindset I think this is the biggest eye-opener and most difficult. There's no cookbook for this. We have cookbooks for so many other things, but th there's no cookbook for this. Mm -hmm. Katrina, you wanted to add to that? Yeah, I, I, just building on that, I think what was really interesting was you called it the DNA of an organization. And I see the DNA of EY um, internally changing a great deal. 
Um, if we think about that and we um, we think about, well, actually, what is it we're asking the organization to do? Well, we're actually asking the organization to go through gene therapy. We're asking the organization <laughs> to, to look at us as, as, as CRISPR would do and think about how we could entirely um, rejuvenate the organization. Now, we're calling that codifying EY, codifying EY using artificial intelligence, using transformative technologies. And in order to codify what it is that we think we will be doing, we need to understand what's the future state. So we need to look at the vision of the, the future state, work our way back, and then codify that, uh, that technology. And I think what's fascinating about that is that um, the CIOs, so our audience here today and us, we are responsible for this. This is a really exciting time. It's in our gift to ensure that the board understand the implications of transforming our own business, to ensure that our people understand um, how we're going to deliver that safely, um, and also to create the, um, the, the processes um, to, in order for us to transform. So I think what a gift, Hendrik. What a fantastic opportunity for us to really alter the DNA of our firms. And we're the masters of that. We're in control. The CIOs have got to step up and take that ownership. So um, that's certainly what I'm doing in EY. I'm very excited about the future. Okay. Arlene, let's let's talk about the innovation at, at DB Cargo. I mean, you're a very engineer-driven, traditional organization, has been around for a long time. So how do you how do you innovate in uh, in, in in a company like yours? Um, so how um, what's the innovation model? How do you work together with the with the business? Can you talk a little bit about that? Mm -hmm. Yes, but before that, maybe a, a short exit. If you, if you look about innovation cycles, I mean, if we are old economy and we have been around for close to two hundred years, and if you think about it, then there was a time where mobility was conquering the world and eating the world, right? That's how we discovered North North America and, and really broaden our horizon. And when you look at it right now, I mean, we had this, and that's, I like that the way Daniel just um, expanded on this. Then we had a time where we were saying software is eating the world, right? Everything is now uh, software driven. And now we have the century where AI is eat, eating the world. And I think the innovation sites became shorter and shorter. In, in that space of technology. But for us as being an, an old economy where we have a lot of um, old legacy, not just software, but also equipment, we still have equipment that, that is hundred years old, it's, it's very um, challenging to make that shift. And when, and when we look at our, our um, working um, colleagues in the operations, then for them, the manual work means that they take a lot of pride in, in that, in that particular area because they they know that they have been building also um, the country Germany itself and, and as, as well the European um, uh, the whole European economy we are critical infrastructure we're the backbone of the industry we transport uh, goods all across um, Europe so in terms of our innovation is definitely to also explain um, very much to our people and on the ground staff in, in the productions what it means uh, for their day to day, what it means for them to utilize digital tools. And we do it in, in an approach where we engage very early with them on wanted internally to really um, utilize the experiences that people maybe have also in their home environment where they use digital, um, they, they use phones or other digital applications. And we bring that to the table and obviously also looking very much what our partners are doing and also looking very much on how we can learn from our partners, but also from, from our competitors. So we use a very collaborative uh, way of using internal perspectives and matching um, them with best practices, not just in the logistics uh, or rail freight um, uh, industry, but also looking beyond it and see what we can leverage and also find excitement in bringing new technologies um, as an inspiration to, to the company. So the people have also fun in trying out new things. Okay. Thank you for that, Arlene. Now, Arte, I know that you, was it at Harvard that you took a, a, a a class or on on uh, or an education on on innovation. What what did you learn there that we can apply today in our in our businesses? Yeah, I, I would love to say it's the class about innovation because it's the whole legacy of Clayton Christensen. Uh, we all know him, so he he made a lot of models uh, and has 
decades and decades of research into just the different types of innovation and the distinction he makes is between disruptive and sustainable innovation. Uh, so uh, it's it's a lovely class. It's still there, and it's it's his life's uh, life's work and legacy. Uh, he's not longer with us, unfortunately, but uh, his legacy is still there. I love that disruptions happen now and then, and then still, uh, because uh, we all know that consulting firms and methodologies are trying to really make definitions on uh, disruptive technology. So what is disruptive innovation, for instance? Then you have to really have that uh, challenger really reinvent a, a certain service or sector in such a way that a larger group will uh, make use of it. So it cannot be uh, that you add to it because then it's sustainable innovation. It's one so many. So for instance, one of the discussions I had with the professors at Harvard is, is Tesla as a technology is that a disruptive innovation or sustainable innovation? Well, while they did not change or the whole sector, because there are also other brands and other um, uh, yeah services uh, close to Tesla, that's why it's sustainable innovation, even if it's uh, forward-looking, but it's not disruptive or disrupting a sector in such a way, or it's not um, at a price point so overshoot services at a price point that it really blows away all of the other players in a uh, sector it's really interesting because the 90 percent of all innovations all innovations are um, sustainable innovations. So what you call sustainable innovation could you maybe um, give us an example of one of the most beautiful innovation projects that have been implemented at KPN uh, the last uh, year or so, uh, RT? Yeah, so, so a lot of uh, examples that are exactly that are, um, you could say that if you're changing the way we are uh, connecting, so from 3G, 4G, 5G to XG, uh, that sustainable innovation will always move on. Uh, also the way we connect each other, or the way we watch TV, is it linear? Or how do we watch TV? Where do we watch TV? Or uh, how do we connect for uh, iOS and Android applications? Or how do we enter um, not just uh, services towards an in individual or an address or a home or a office, but even beyond that? In this case, you, we use, uh, within my IT organization, we use the abbreviation LEAD wherein the L stands for lean organization because you could do uh, you could utilize new technologies to become a leaner uh, more reasonable size uh, or lean organization by means of RPA or by means of AI and the second part so the E of lead is for enable business growth you could really uh, utilize technologies, finding new revenue growth options for you, and the A to come up with agility, and that has to do with architecture throughout your enterprise, and the D is drive cost effectiveness. So one of the examples is you could really use um, technology and give meaning in uh, thinking of new services for your customers, because uh, the Customers of Telco are really susceptible of churn. They are easily, um, and this is a real problem. Uh, so, for instance, we could really and have to utilize and give meaning to technology to think of how do we uh, serve field services? How do we go about field services? How do we go about man channel? How could we prevent? field engineers and man channel engineers in going there, avoiding the frustrations at customers, but really having that self-healing systems or self-maintenance systems or analytics of mm -hmm. giving them a root cause of what's happening. This okay. could be there or it could be with customer support or it could be in thinking of new services. Uh, so that lead, that abbreviation gives us a clue on 
either top line growth or bottom line optimizations that we can utilize technology for. And we are in all of these spaces. Okay. Thank you so much. Yes, I would, I would actually, if I, if, if I may, I actually would still like to answer to, to the Tesla example. In my opinion, it was very disruptive. You know, we're coming from an automotive company that was very, very hardware driven. All of a sudden, Tesla comes along and, and creates this, this amazing software and builds basically the hardware around it. And I think this is when you, when you talk about mobility in my, in, in my area, it, it's something that happened many years ago, right? We were having all these, um, uh, people that were basically moving around with uh, carriages and horses, right? And then the Benz brothers came along and basically said, no, you, there's, a, there's an easier way to do it. And they basically provided um, that to the people. And I think sometimes innovation is also not just um, answering to the demand, but also creating just a better way of uh, getting a different perspective. And I think when, when um, I look at, at Tesla, I think that's exactly what they did. They thought more from a com consumer and said, okay, how can we make it um, sustainable. Uh, it's, it's an electric car, but how do we make it easier for the consumer to, to utilize it? Preaching to the choir. Automated driving behind. I them. should I have had you in the classroom because <laughs> all of my uh, fellow classmates really saw me passionately, really intensely have the same argument. What if Tesla had that overshoot services at a low price point? then it could have wiped out all of the could other have brands. Completely disrupted all other, and we would yeah. not have BMW and Mercedes anymore. Then, then, there then you that's your definition of disruption. There right, you no? go. Yeah. <laughs> Katrina, completely with you, Arlene. <laughs> Katrina, you, I mean, your job is your innovation officer at, at EY. Mm -hmm. So this is your day-to-day -day job. So tell us a little bit about your innovation model approach and, and, yeah. and strategy within EI, EY. Sure. I, th I think um, I think there's a lot of commonality with what um, RT said and the human-centered design approach that we ad we adopted in EY. Um, with humans at the center of our innovation process, we follow the double diamond technique. That's effectively where you look at a challenge that you have to solve. You then diverge to understand more about the issues, the market. You converge on a number of solutions, choose one diverge again to do more market testing, more insight, and then you converge again to create the, uh, the solution. And, and yeah. by doing that in combination with your, yeah, to Artie's thumbs up. Um, Beautiful. I, I think by doing that double diamond technique, you're, you're absolutely certain, and I think I, I feel most strongly about this, that you're creating something that's been market tested that's not going to necessarily fail as easily as something that could be, you know, some blue sky thinking that some group somewhere has done. Um, the scaling of that innovation, though, Hendrik, is hard. It's really, really tough to do. I think startups um, and, and initiatives that are small, really easy. I think where we've done it quite differently in EY um, is that we have a, a global investment fund. And that global investment fund is there when you've created the right business case um, with that double diamond technique in mind, and you've created the right innovation. You can go to that fund, submit your request, and then they will help you scale that globally. And it's having that centralized function for innovation, for scaling activity that gives you the, the marketing support, the product management support, the technology support that, that helps you succeed, as opposed to trying to just do it within your own silo. So I am um, I'm delighted that that's helped us create some really incredibly innovative solutions here internally. And, and I'll just mention one of them, Hendrik, because I think it's it's interesting for all of us. Um, organizations nowadays, including ourselves, um, can access R&D tax credits, research and development tax credits the world over with the various different organizations. And, you know, how, how important is that nowadays to be able to innovate, right, as an organization? Well, what we did was we teamed with a number of our data scientists and we pulled together data in various different locations. And I'll just use the UK as an example, where we can look at the regulation around R&D tax credits. We can look at an organization's, you know, annual report and accounts. We can we can look at various different sources to see if they've claimed against those potential R&D tax credits. And then we can go back to them and say, listen, if you want to innovate in this area, here it is. Now, all of that is done through automation of data. That doesn't take a human being. It doesn't take an R&D tax credit expert to do that. We've built, we've codified the EY knowledge around tax into that solution and that services clients. 
So it's just one example, Hendrik, of codifying using data science and using a human-centered design approach, and that went through that technique um, in order to um, in order to scale it. Okay, super. I'd love to ask a question of the the panelists. Um, there's, if you will, to, to oversimplify it, there's two models. There's the, the top down, this is what leadership says, how we're going to innovate. And then there's the bottom up of arm all the stakeholders with the right tools, the DNA changes, and see what ideas percolate up and use a portfolio model to decide where you're going to go. What are you do using and what are you seeing that works? Maybe Arlene, you want to take that question? How, how, what's the, the overall uh, approach in, in DB Cargo for this? So I love the, this um, portfolio management. Daniel, when you mentioned portfolio, obviously we are we're a very traditional company. We're more than 300,000 all in all. German Railway, we have very traditional uh, processes. So obviously there's limited, uh, there are limited resources available. And we do use portfolio mix. We do, we do use the Ghana methodology where we look at the portfolio mix and where we specifically allocate half of the portfolio to innovative topics using transform and grow uh, budgets and then uh, obviously the, the not so interesting part but necessary run and protect and within that space when we look at um, the innovation budget i call it innovation budget transform and grow we obviously also have a strategic roadmap that we um, where we look into what capabilities do we need in the next uh, three to five years and how uh, does technology fit into the overall business plan of enhancing the market share for a DB Cargo, for instance? And then we definitely do a bottom up and and um, bottom up and top down approach, but more setting the strategic direction in terms of what capabilities we need, um, what are our strategic drivers, and then also uh, leveraging um, all the ideas that are coming from the business and matching it, and having uh, very much a, a, a collaboration together with our business partners as IT and digital organization and to come up with the best solution possible. It's a very painful process, yes. It's a very <laughs> painful process, but I think it's a very necessary process and it helps us also to to always challenge and also be quite adaptive when um, when the situation changes. I and mean, we, we, for us as a logistics company with this horrible um, Ukraine war that is happening, that obviously also changed a lot in our business model. So we needed to adapt very fast uh, to that as well. Okay, I'm gonna bring in a question from the uh, from the audience. By the way, we've got hundreds of people following us on all the different platforms here in this. Uh, we're live on YouTube, uh, Facebook, uh, and and LinkedIn, and so on and so on. So one of the questions that came in was, well, does any any of you have kind of a, a, a system to uh, to to seek and to identify and to manage innovative ideas? So, so is there are there some tools or processes that you use to to manage uh, the, 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 all the, and, and the potential 300,000 people that come up with new ideas, 11,000 at KPN. Uh, so how do you manage that in, inside a, a big organizations like these? Well, I, I can go if you'd, if you'd, sure. if you'd like, Hendrik. So um, we've um, democratized innovation across EY, across our 300,000 people. We don't believe that any one person has the right answer. And we also believe in co-developing with clients so we use the people who have the closest proximity to the to the issues in hand to create the innovation for our business. I mentioned that innovation fund that sits at the center. We have templatized the approach to creating innovative solutions for our business. And then once that solution is tried, tested in the local market, we can then assess it for global application. And then that team steps in and supports the globalization. So it is democratized. And to your point about platforms, yes, we have a platform. You can surface ideas. We then uh, will sort those ideas based on upvoting. And then um, my central team support the innovation process. So to give you an example, that R&D program I mentioned earlier, that's currently being supported um, by the central function in order to better productize it for our markets. And I think that's I think I think that's you know it's a great approach because if you think about the incredible technology talent joining our businesses and indeed non-tech people who have you know s incredible ideation, then we need to support them by embracing their ideas and helping um, them future-proof our organisations because they're the future of the business. Okay, thank you so much. I'm going to close down here the the first of the three topics. 
that we uh, want to discuss uh, in this uh, in this conference. And let's go to the uh, to the second topic. And uh, I think um, uh, we're going to do a write up of this conference. And the potential title is AI is eating the world. So let's talk about uh, AI and 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 if it is really eating the world. So Katrina, you have written uh, a, a book on this uh, topic. Let me see. Here it is, AI by design. So that's uh, that's your book. Congratulations with that. So tell us a little bit uh, about the book and, and and let's can you give us uh, in in a couple of minutes the, the big picture of where we are with uh, AI today. Sure. Well, just as our, our panelists have, have said, um, truly disruptive technology, um, you know, is is something that we all deal with day in day out. But AI is not new. It's been around since the 1950s. And um, when we look at some of the incredible recent adoption of AI, it's really come as a result of us popularizing a single technology platform, that is GPT. Now, the reason that that's popularized AI um, amongst our fellow man is because it's an incredibly usable interface, incredibly easy to use. Now, if I, if I look back at 2003, in the search engine market, there was AltaVista, there was Yahoo, there was Ask Jeeves, there was a ton of search engines. But then Google came along with a really simplistic interface and conquered it all. So what GPT has done is, is not only is it a fascinating technology was it with an incredible amount of um, machine learning parameters in there, 175 billion to be exact. Um, but what it is, is it's an incredibly inherent usable interface. So in order to extract value from AI and in order to implement AI and create that competitive advantage, I think we require a number of things. And I'll turn to my panelists now to get their view, but I think it requires talent, it requires the right technology, and it requires the right processes and governance. Um, and, I'll, and, I'll, and I'll turn now to, um, to, to Artie or, 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 or Daniel um, or Arlene really to talk about how they're seeing AI influence their business and, and, and really what they're putting in place in order to create that competitive value. Who wants to go first? Well, couldn't agree more. And I've said something uh, on, in the same line, saying that so in the past 25 years, I've seen that uh, sometimes technologies come and go, but AI and machine learning was always there. To be honest, it was always there. It's not there's nothing new. It's just advanced, and we've seen in our uh, career that um, sometimes things get a push when something happens in the private environment. For instance, if you have t new technologies entering home home offices first or home users or private users first and then it gets more pushed into pro professional corporate lives because of people expecting the speed of uh, of, of use cases with large uh, companies as well. That's what happens with ChatGPT as well. Now mm -hmm. that our children are using it in schools so or for school papers, mm -hmm. or um, uh, as I said, so sometimes they use it, and I used it also to uh, seek medical advice. You can mm -hmm. use ChatGPT for mm -hmm for it and then so it's sort of like democratized and now this is what's these type of evolutions are going to shift the needle in corporate mm -hmm. life uh, so uh, security officers or um, operate operators or operations departments saying no 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 or internal or external regulators saying no this is scary we shouldn't use it are now saying okay if it if there are use cases there maybe we should uh and and that's the title of your book i'm gonna buy it how to live with it yeah how do you live with it uh, i love that uh underline in your book i love it because you have to live with it because it's gonna happen anyway so right. it's not prevention yeah. or putting the the focus on the scariness uh, of it but rather accepting that change is a constant of life and how do we live with it? How do, how do we govern yep. uh, AI and how do we govern these new technologies and how do we make... Uh, because in the scarcity of talent, as you are also saying, there's really no choice for us mm. uh, than to uh, 
really implement uh, technologies to make it easier on us. Uh, so I love that. I'm, I'm super curious about your book. So maybe Arlene, could, could you elaborate a little bit on, on, on AI within a very traditional uh, railway freight company? How, where, do, where do you see the big opportunities of the, uh, the challenging that you're, uh, um, that you're uh, working on right now? So the, the, um, a little bit boring. Oh, sorry, maybe. that was for Arlene. I, I, Arlene, oh, yeah, you said. Oh, it's it's okay. <laughs> so sorry. I, yeah, um, actually, I I see two two aspects, but more on the positive side. Of, for for German way, where there are huge opportunities. I mean, we are in in the areas of passenger and and transport. So if you look at our our. Um, passengers that are using us uh, our goal is to achieve 200 million uh, travelers a, a year so that means there's a huge amount of data available and uh, looking now from a customer perspective obviously we would like to make it easy we would like people to leave the car behind or the uh, don't use the plane and, and use the trains and um, obviously we have to create a very very good um customer interface, meaning that we have to push constantly um, information. Is the train available? Is there maybe a, a breakdown? Is there uh, another mode of transportation uh, at my destination? Can I uh, uh, do car sharing or um, rent a scooter? So so data management is, is very, very important for us. And I think this is the first aspect that I would like a little bit elaborate on this because for me, AI, yes, it is definitely something that um, will come and is already there. But in order to have a functioning AI that our that our customers are actually benefiting from, is really the data quality and data management behind it. Not a very sexy topic, but for us a huge challenge because we have 18 different uh, business divisions, and as I said, we do share the same tracks. So. For us, it means the, the data um, integration or the data information has to be seamless. Meaning if I am in the train and we have a storm and, and the tree is actually on the tracks, that is like a domino effect. All the other traffic will be influenced. And us as cargo trains, we usually go at nighttime. Meaning um, if we have on the, uh, during a day, some sort of an accident, the whole chain uh, goes back days because all our planning is, is affected. So there I, I see huge, huge, huge potential. And we have already a couple of use cases where we can optimize um, our planning processes and, and do it more in a predictive way and really using, for instance, love this, this use case, weather data, meaning looking back at the last five years and on this day, on May 5th, what is the probability that there's a storm coming, right? And, and also looking into other variations. And I think that's where AI is very, very powerful in terms of planning. The other mm -hmm. use case that we have already implemented at uh, DB Cargo, even though we are a little bit old economy, not as, as far as the automotive, but it's very much into, into maintenance, predictive maintenance, using very much um, also um, photos. Uh, that we synthesized over the last couple of years with uh, a couple of uh, hundred of millions of pictures right now of all our freight wagons. We have 92,000 freight wagons all across Europe and also um, detecting very early if there's um, a possible breakdown and send them into maintenance. So, so these are some existing use cases that we're looking at and obviously um, capacity management, how do we, um, how, how can we bring more traffic, more trains on the track, and how can we do it in, in a way that we can shorten the, the, the breakage ways? Obviously, it has to be very safe, but how can we um, ensure this? And, and also another fantastic use case I, I love is, is energy consumption, where we can, where we use today, um, I already, um, when, when we purchase energy or also how we preserve energy, because we have such a huge fleet and uh, we can leverage definitely on the technology that is out there. So very much on the consumer side, but also on the B2B side. And as I said, the, the basis is data management and data quality. And that's a, a constant uh, challenge and a constant battle. Okay. Katrina, I know that governance of AI is really a, a topic that's very close to your heart. Can, can you elaborate a little bit on that, what you mean and why that's uh, so important? Sure. And I, I think, Daniel, given your AI background as well, just chime in as well. But I think that there's a lot of regulation coming down the pipe at us business. Um, and I think if I look at the EU AI Act, which will be enacted into law at the end of this year or early next, I think the onus will be on organizations, boards to ensure that 
ethical and unbiased AI um, and um, adherence to privacy um, concerns is is dealt with by organizations boards. So I think having a, a, a trust and ethics framework within the organization is really, really important. Um, and a way to audit what we're doing is essential within the organization. So our internal audit, our risk teams need to be engaged. But Daniel, do, do you have any comments on that? Oh, yes. And, and I, I guess I bring the United States perspective to the table, which in many ways, for better or for worse, the United States is the Wild West. <laughs> <laughs> And um, it was <laughs> and still is in some ways. Right. In terms of right state regulation, yep. um, I, I see that we have a collective action problem at a societal level mm -hmm. that and the there aren't strong regulatory bodies in our United States Congress. It seems to be um, incapable of legislating anything right now, including our budget, let alone something as complex as this. And so the we'll have the challenge of a first mover advantage that the market incents every organization to take combined with exactly what i read your book and i was very much uh, aligned with the katrina of there are social organizational level and personal level ethical concerns that we have to take into account of on the one hand where it's appropriate to use uh this very easy in, uh, system of engagement mm -hmm. And on the other hand, um, um, it, do we have, um, as Arlene talked about, the right data? Because mm -hmm. someone who thinks this is really easy to use, but they're pointing at the wrong data corpus, mm -hmm. can get um, very bad answers out of it and think that's the truth. Um, the old saying, guy go, right? Garbage in, garbage out, still applies in this day and age. And so... Um, I believe very much is that at uh, industry group levels and organizational levels, uh, there's going to have to be uh, in the United States, greater leadership, uh, more than Elon Musk's letter of a six month halt to AI rollouts. Mm -hmm. There's going to have to be a, a broader industry conversation about um, how we as organizations continue to democratize innovation without, um, and forgive this U S analogy, uh, handing children loaded guns. Right? That's a big question. Huh? Is AI a loaded gun or not? So, um, so what's the um, what's the feelings about that? I wouldn't say it's a loaded gun, but I, but um, I have this example of and um, there's a company in Germany that uh, develops uh, soap dispensers, and and I think it also shows that uh, in some ways diversity is is very very important. So what happened when? When the soap dispenser was created, and there was auto, obviously also an automation behind it, that a person that um, was of color put put the hand underneath, and there was no soap coming out because it was programmed that way. Sorry to say, by white men uh, that were just not thinking. It was not discriminating against it, but the technology was just developed that there was nothing else than that white in the algorithm. Oh wow! So this is yeah. something. I think where, where you can look at it and, and see that in terms of um, technology or also in, in algorithms that they have to be created in a non-discriminating way. And, and what does it mean also in terms of regulations? What, what do you actually put in? Because you don't want also that when we put trust in all these systems that and, and put the trust in that they make decisions that are not making the wrong decisions. For instance, we at German Railway, we use it also for recruiting um, uh, our, our young, young, younger workforce. So you want to make sure that it's not just in the, in the shortlist, only white male people <laughs> that are being interviewed, right? So this is something also that, that we are also looking at in terms of ethics and, and regulation, not just regulation, but also very much into, into ethics. What does it mean for us? as a company when we put AI in, in place. So good to hear you're doing that. Yeah. And a, a very important, uh, we, we discussed talent, technology, governance, and I mean, as being uh, three very dimen uh, important dimensions of, of AI and, and technologies. Uh, I mean, we, we already touched a couple and, and there's ample enough technology and we're really at the breakthrough at the moment with these, uh, the, with, with these large, uh, language models and so on. Um, but let's talk about talent for, for AI and data science in, in, in general. I mean, because that's, that's, that's a big thing. I mean, at, uh, maybe at, at KPN, uh, Arti, how is, how, where are your data scientists and, and your AI people? Where do they sit in the organization? Is it easy for you to, 
to attract the right amount of, of them? What's, what's your talent view on, uh, on AI and data at the moment? Well, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna lie. I'm not gonna say it's easy or uh, it comes naturally because it, you really have to put a lot of effort in it. As Arlene was also saying, you are building for the diversity. That means you have to be diverse yourself as well uh, in your team composition and in your uh, organization. Uh, it's hard. We're all fishing in the same pond, so it's it's really really hard. The more you need uh, people that are forward looking and really on that uh, making an impact and, and and really driving change the more difficult it is to find that so you have to really culture and foster a um uh, cultivate and, and foster a culture where you are open to those new talents and new talents and ha that has been shown in a lot of research is is also very much focused to joining companies that have a social purpose and uh, an environmental purpose and wants to do good by using technology. Uh, so just having the coolest job or uh, the job uh, that pays well is not enough. So mm -hmm. we, we put a lot of effort in this and within our company we have uh, a how do you say, upstream data and analytics team and a downstream data and analytics team. And we made the deliberate choice uh, for the uh, chief uh, data officer to be the boss of both. So you can marry the roles. I was really also curious uh, of asking, if I may, to oh. Arlene, uh, because um, if I listen carefully to your stories, you're really open in sharing that ah, we've been here for hundreds and hundreds of years, our company, and we are fully aware of the, the path we have to go through for legacy and uh, to move up the ladder in new technologies. But could you share a little bit so that I can also learn from you uh, how you deal with uh, legacy in people's minds. So legacy in technology, we can fix. Mm -hmm. Legacy in people's minds. That's a tough one, yeah. <laughs> I don't have the answer yet. We're trying every day. But I think what what uh, I think the benefit that we have uh, as 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 a state company is we are very purpose driven, right? I mean, we don't. We always used to joke. We don't need purpose workshops. We know why we get up every morning. Oh, and so nice. that's for one being a very sustainable company. On the other hand. I don't know if I could say that, but in a way, it's, it's also like German Web is not uh, like the most popular company because we have a lot of delays. But I always say you have the opportunity to be part of this, to make it better, right? To make it better, to use definitely the technology to make it better that we get our functionality rate of capacity management. And I think what we do very much is, and I, and I love that about this company, we we don't discriminate against age or any kind of uh, of uh, um, discrimination here, gender. And, and so this is something that, that I find very important to also uh, implement as a company uh, programs in place. We call it 50 plus program where you can still change your profession. And that's absolutely normal. Now we have generations of people here that have been with uh, German Railway 30, 40 years. We have the grandfather, the father, uh, or the grandmother, <laughs> and oh, the, wow. the children that are working. There's a, there's a absolute pride, and I think it's it's a lot of uh, bringing this appreciation to work and also instilling this in our leadership team that we are we are basically the resemblance of the German society. Like we are we are a state company, and I think this works very much to really mix the the experiences that we have from our older work with the younger uh, one is how do we do it a lot this combination when we are in factories we have a program in place where we know that people are leaving us in the next uh, five years and we basically put a tandem in place with a young person oh and great young person appreciates in the maintenance okay how do you do it manually and he can also because he's more agile and has more uh, interest in technology also bring him a bit more into this world and uh, this proved very successfully and we have quite a bit of use cases where, where there's like and one use case I can just say it's, it's augmented reality that we have um, when you look at some of our um, local trains they're 50 years old so today nobody knows anymore how to repair them so we need to preserve that knowledge yeah. 
And how do we use it yeah. with augmented reality where you basically get a young person that or the older person explains the young person where to what tools to use and we transfer it in, in a digital way using augmented reality so that we preserve A, the know-how and B, the younger person has actually fun then learning something new using new technology. What great examples. Yeah, love it. Uh, on the, uh, Katrina, on yes, the, I, I, yeah. I wanted to go to you because finding talent, sometimes you have to do special things to find the right talent, right? Yeah, so I wanted to mention a couple of things. In order to upskill our people around the world, um, our leadership put in place just a couple of years ago a free tech MBA for any member of staff anywhere in the world. So all 300,000 people can apply for and can do uh, a technology MBA. So I thought that was just incredible. And, and obviously, as a purpose-led organization, um, enhancing our sustainability agenda is also something we've done. So we offer a free master's in sustainability too. But the thing that I really wanted to mention was um, thinking outside the box for, um, for talent is something that we've done within our data science team of late. Um, we've uh, created a neurodiverse center of excellence. Uh, it's based in Manchester in England, um, here in UK and Ireland. And what we've done is we've changed the recruitment process to adapt it and the extended supported environment to enhance the experience of working for us for neurodivergent individuals. So when I say neurodivergence, I'm talking about dyslexia, dyspraxia, dyscalculia, ADHD or autism. And so what, we have a number of amazing, amazing data scientists and engineers who help our organization, um, who are in our, our neurodiverse center of excellence. And honestly, it, it gives me um, it, incredible, incredible um, insight into the superpowers that people with neurodivergent characteristics um, have and, and service our company better as a result. Okay. Yeah, that's. I mean, very, very impressive. What uh, what what you're doing there, Daniel? Let's um, let's talk a bit about um, UI. Is UI part becoming an AI company? I mean, how how much of your software is is now becoming AI? Do you, is, yeah. is is there a way to measure that or not? Um, the first the answer to your first question is yes. The answer to your second question is I don't know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, we're at so we sell ourselves, Gartner and um, Forrester um, talk about us as an intelligent automation firm mm -hmm. that is the combination of RPA and AI, machine learning, neural networks, bigger AI models. And then lastly, the platform on which that is all housed, uh, including, as mentioned earlier, uh, you know, an idea capture tool and the other control plane that a, a CIO in an, an enterprise architects want to know that this technology is managed as an enterprise class application. Um, so, and what, what we're seeing is that, uh, you know, RPA has sort of, we, we've developed the technology you need there. And so the, the new world is machine vision, uh, document understanding, uh, and, and now the more complex cognitive tools for uh, complex decision making based on Bayesian logic and uh, neural networks and the like, and that is exactly what we have and are rolling out. Mm -hmm. um, so, give us a little bit the big picture of. I mean, let's go to our third topic: intelligent automation, RPA, software robots, and then AI and and and, and all that together, machine learning. What, what's the, give us the big picture so that we can then drill down on how this is uh, used in the, in the tree. Sure. Uh, organizations here today. Right. So I, I, I like to think about it as a digital fabric, right? Your, the, the big threads, the big cords in your fabric weave are your ERP, your CRM, your HCM, your supply chain tools, et cetera. And if uh, transportation is going to have your own set that has a few other things, scheduling the like, you get the idea. Those are big, heavy cords. Um, uh, those are the systems of record. Uh, you then will have systems of engagement, which is in theory makes it easier for the users to interact with those because systems of record are often very hard to interact with. And the if those are the vertical threads in my fabric, the horizontals are a system of orchestration. And that's what we do. We are the complement to those core transactional systems, not a competitor, but um, to switch my metaphors, um, we can complete the last mile of process orchestration or orchestrate across large transactional systems when 
you know, logically um, coding and um, API integration, you could do it in the core systems. There's just not enough time or money, in fact, to do it. But because the scale of intelligent automation doing things is um, geometrically smaller in time and cost to get the same work done, it just gives CIOs a new opportunity to say yes to business demands and get it done faster uh, rather than saying, well, you know what, that's 38th in the list of what my ERP team needs to do. We might get to it next year and it's going to take three quarters. Now, look, we're not a replacement to an ERP system. I'm not at all claiming that. But for those discrete process orchestration, data movement things, our, our, a low code environment allows you to deliver results faster. Um, now it would go to, go to AI, right? So AI is excellent for what's the next best action, categorizing, extraction, um, pattern recognition at a vast scale that humans can't do. Great. So remember what I said before is Geigo, right? If garbage in, garbage out. So you need to have a good data corpus. And again, the systems of record and the systems of orchestration like UiPath help create the data corpus that you want to train your AI engines against. On the back end, AI has a brilliant insight and next action, uh, suggestions for new strategies. Again, you need to orchestrate the actions that flow from that. So to um, my, my crude human body metaphor is uh, AI is the brain and your systems of record and intelligent automation are the muscles that make sure the right you know, nutrition gets into the brain and then takes action when the brain says to go do something. Okay. Does that resonate Good. with my other panelists? Nice metaphor. Yeah, and uh, what the interesting thing is in, in our panel here, We've got with, with DB Cargo and KPN and EY, we've got three completely different, let's say, points where you are in the roadmap for, for, for RPA and, 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 and approaches to, uh, to RPA. Arlene, if we start with DB Cargo, I, I understand you're still in, in the very first phase, phases of, uh, of, of uh, adopting RPA. What, what, what's, can, can you maybe very shortly say where are you today and how do you see it evolving? We are in the sad uh, valley of tears and uh, it, uh, data quality, data governance. It is a very painful <laughs> mountain to climb on. And Daniel, I totally agree. We would love to be further. I mean, my passion is definitely, but we have to do our homework first. So we just started with um, maintenance and we did install camera bridges where we actually look into um, uh, detection of, of faults and that's now one of the early stages that we are going in but I'm, I'm very hopeful that once we have the data quality and governance uh, under more control there's a vast variety of uh, use cases that we can also implement yeah I mean you can imagine in, in, in your environment there's huge, huge uh, opportunity to create efficiencies and, and uh, in, in, in all the different processes that you have. RT, in KPN, you have a, yeah, you told me you have a bottom up approach. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah, so uh, a little bit more abundance in uh, people and technologies and budgets, maybe. But uh, we really believe, and also uh, earlier we touched upon it uh, top down or bottom up. We really believe in bottom up and use portfolio mix. Uh, connected to the corporate strategy leads to business strategy leads to technology strategy kind of framework uh, to help build all of these use cases and mature them and also sometimes down the line you have to kill your darlings because of the, that portfolio mix uh, um, yeah how do you say decision making i love that uh, about it I, I would also love to offer Ar arlene uh, some uh, the, some notes because uh, we talked about that chinese sign even though we are doing lots of the things together because of the abundance that is still there but sometimes scarcity can help you out Sometimes if you have scarce resources or you have scarce uh, options, you make the better decision because then 
um, you, you will really touch upon, hopefully, if I would have less people, I've seen that in other positions or less systems to go over or less siloed organization, which is obviously hard in a uh, huge organization, uh, then you could have um, made some uh, married a little bit of choices, the hygiene factor of uh, data, the hygiene factor of where data sits, or the data quality, data performance, and then build all the AI and RPA on top, where in, in our organization, we have democratized it, and it's a bottom up approach and there are really lots of ideas and it's so it's also a painful process here i can tell you if you say okay there are too many demands or there are too many ideas and there are too many people uh, thinking of well, yeah this is the best idea and then how do you make those decisions uh, so even though we're on the other end we have sort of similar problems also <laughs> Okay. Can, I jump in for, can I just jump in for a moment? Because I think that really resonates. Um, I am seeing several of our customers who have pervasive data problems like Arlene is facing, and yet they're able to find segments where they there can have a problem and derive value quickly that then they bank that value back into the system to do more. I'll give you two examples. Is one of which we're working with a North American uh, telco company and truck rolls are the most expensive thing, sending a person out into the field to go to a house and, you know, jiggle the wires. Um, we're and oftentimes they find out they've got the wrong part in the truck mm -hmm. and have to go back and do a second house visit or office visit. Um, we were able to use our intelligent automation platform to uh, reduce their truck roll percent uh, by something in the order of 25% because they had the, the, the right person, the right talent level with the right parts on the right truck at the right time. On the other hand, there's call centers where um, allowing an agent to have the right answer and um, uh, perhaps even deflect the call to a uh, chat channel in advance using the decision logic built into our RPA tool uh, can reduce your call time and just reduce the call uh, volumes, which again, 100% frees people up to spend more time yeah. on the calls that really oh. count for that human interaction so that they, yeah. you know, don't we, quite. We have a lot of these ideas already in practice, where in month over month, you can see the cost of uh, call center, the cost of customer support, also the cost of service engineers, field engineers going down by use of technology because you can really predict and also by execution only and self-healing uh, for your customers because customers do not want to wait for an engineer. They want to analyze their cells. So that's completely true. And also adding or building on it, we, we didn't mention it yet, but for adoption, adaption, coaching, even if it's your own customer support or it's your end customers, these technologies are brilliant. Yeah. Katrina, I wanted to come to uh, to you. I mean, your approach to uh, aut automation, RPN, and, and so on is you. I understand you have uh, there's a center of excellence, and there's something called EY Fabric as well. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah. So going back to what Daniel said about garbage in, garbage out, we realized that we had to get some of the basics right. And um, to use a kind of Lego analogy, what we decided to do is we decided to work out what was it that was that was really beneficial to our entire organization. Let's take those. Um, those those bots we've developed, let's take the RPA processes, let's take those examples and let's pop them all into a central fabric. So what we've done is we've taken a, a whole lot of technology um, tools and techniques and we've created a central resource. Now, all over the world, we've got a ton of no code or low code technologies that would enhance our productivity. And what we've done is we've opened that up to all of our people across the world. So tried and tested, case study proven, ROI generative um, technologies in that Lego block that you download and you can create your own personalized experience for you and your client projects or your internal projects. I think um, part of, the, part of the, um, the, the real USP there, though, Hendrik, is having the one owner internally who really gets that. And that's our CTO globally. His name is Nicola Marini Bianzino. 
and he's on our global executive. So we have someone at the highest order, highest level of our organization, owning that, democratizing that in a very safe, with the right guardrails around it, a very safe manner. And that's how we've been able to deploy our, our RPA solutions, right, Daniel, um, yeah. across EY. Okay, super. What I suggest, we, we, we've got a, like six minutes left. So um, what I want to do is, um, uh, is give Arlene, Artie and Katrina all two minutes and then uh, Daniel can uh, make the summary of this, um, of this beautiful afternoon conference or morning conference in, uh, in Seattle, what, what we have learned. So um, what I would like to, um, to, uh, to know from each of you is, could you still give me one very specific example of, of, of a thing around digital innovation that you and your teams are very the most proud of, that you think this is really inspirational for, uh, for everybody that, that follows this conference? What is the one thing, innovation, the, the, uh, could be a very small thing that you say, this is really, really cool that we're doing in our organization that fits under the digital innovation now umbrella. Maybe, Arlene, we can start with you. <laughs> yeah, I'm very proud that we're doing a first step to creating the Amazon interface, like uh, for ordering freight uh, wagons. And uh, we are using also our uh, co-innovation partner, uh, Salesforce, for that and, and creating a very good uh, customer interface and also using their technology, Salesforce and Service Cloud, and combining the whole customer experience in, in, in B2B. And that has been proven very successful to us. We, we started a co-innovation um, with across all our business uh, lines and uh, IT, including our internal digital partner, uh, DB Sestel and, and Salesforce, and, and created um, first uh, Go Lives last year. And I think for us, being a very old legacy company, we were able to completely use the platform in standard and were able to um, bring in um, the first CRM platform in three months, and we're continuing at this rapid rate using very much partners and using also the AI engines that sets was a bit. So we're using very much the technology um, uh, know-how of our of our partners, and I'm very proud that we are we are having a quite high success rate and adoption rate with us right now. Okay, thank you so much, Arlene. Arty, one so thing. One thing. So I. So uh, a really, really stupid, but uh, there are so many big innovations that I can brag about, but the ones that I really love are the simple things, the really small, small thing, uh, simple things. So I'm not talking about Android TV or iOS TV or all of those big innovation or multi-SIM or eSIM, but when a field engineer comes at a house of a customer, the fact that they have the same interfaces and can show it at that point to their customers and the customers can utilize or have tools to really um, self-heal or uh, improve the, the service at their doorstep, by such simple uh, innovations and simple use cases and digital flows, uh, I love those simple things um, because that's making a huge impact in how we are perceived in our service to our customers at the door. Uh, and it has also the biggest impact on NPS. It's not something big. It's something that's really small. It's really giving that customer the feeling we're here to serve you. And this is a, a digital flow that can help your life become easier. Okay, thank you, Arti. Katrina, the one thing that you're most proud of? Uh, well, I, I have to go with the, with the current thing I'm most proud of. Um, now, obviously, as we've discussed, AI has become um, democratized. There's, there's, there's huge issues. And you mentioned, I love the soap dispenser issue that you talked about earlier. It's a huge amount of very, very big world-class problems coming coming at us thick and fast. And what I'm most proud of is EY has created an AI health check technology and solution. That is a health check. It checks the health of your AI governance internally, your 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 AI processes, your um, processes, what you currently how you currently deploy AI in in relation to the current regulation in the country that you reside in. 
And I'm really, really proud of that because I think keeping our clients and ourselves safe in this quite difficult time, um, I'm, I'm really thinking, I'm, I'm living up to our internal mantra, which is about building a better working world. So I'm very, very proud of that. And I'm very proud of the team that have created that technology and that solution. Okay, thank you so much. Daniel, you have the, the honor to make a nice summary of everything that we discussed here today. I will point out I'm the only panelist who is drinking coffee throughout this call because it was early in the morning and I was worried I, I would not be up to the task without a little caffeine. You wouldn't be falling asleep on us, Daniel. Come on, we're far too interesting. <laughs> um, it, it is a, a, a truly enjoyable to listen to this level of conversation of, of vibrant um, leaders in the technology space. So thank you for inviting me. Um, my crude summary that will not do justice to the uh, quality of the conversation is, first off, complexity and the speed of change. The world is spinning faster and it's more complex. Uh, but we have to be more human centric in the way we deliver technology, both for a customer centricity and employee and other stakeholder centricity at a new level, given the, the implications of this technology. Um, really what Katrina talks about in her book is, and implied in our whole conversation is, there's a whole uh, terra incognita of ethics that we need to work on. And none of us know what that future is, and we're gonna have to be good stewards of that. Uh, there's a culture of innovation that is implied by the, the uh, generative quality of these technologies. And democratization all of a sudden opens it up for a lot more people in the, our organizations and in the world to do things. And the last one really, Katrina said it, and I liked it very much, and I'm just gonna steal her words, is given this complexity and given all the change and given all the implications of this change, CIOs really have to lead. They're the unique role well positioned to understand all the moving parts and all the implications and help their organizations and help our society get to a better place using technology. And on that note, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for a very uh, enjoyable uh, conference. Thank you, Arlene. Thank you, Artie. Thank you, uh, Katrina. Thank you, Daniel. It was uh, really a pleasure. A couple of last uh, announcements. Let me bring that uh, back. Or I repeat, don't forget to go to crnet.tv to check out the videos of Arlene, Katrina, and Arti uh, that are going that uh, that are there. Very very interesting. Make sure to go to crnet.com/cookbook and uh, get your book full of recipes for digital success. If you haven't yet done uh, so, on the 30th of May. I registered to have a co-design uh, session around AI together with our friends from Fujitsu. Uh, thank you again, UiPath and the whole team uh, for organizing this together. It was really a pleasure. And if you want to know, learn a little bit more about UiPath's uh, AI and CIO solutions, very simple, go to uipath.com slash AI or to uh, uipath.com slash solutions slash CIO, that's uh, where you find uh, more uh, information. And so I wanted to, uh, uh, to end with two small videos. And one video is a, is a very short uh, and high energy video that explains our cookbook, uh, just under a minute. And after that, we've got a very uh, interesting and very beautiful video on uh, AI and RPA from UiPath. So I'm saying goodbye to all of you. Thank you so much. Let's go uh, to the videos now. Bye-bye.
Hardworking Maria and Stefan are at that exciting and nerve-wracking stage in their life. Buying a new home. Their biggest obstacle? The 42 days they can expect it to take to secure their loan, which could mean losing out on their dream home. It's no wonder it takes that long. Banks receive over a million mortgage applications a year, with different types of documents coming in from all different places. Processing them requires hundreds of steps, costs billions, and slows down their revenue cycle. What to do? We need to match Maria and Stefan with the right bank, one that can get them sorted in no time. Enter Superior AI Bank. They're doing things differently. How? Not only is the bank automating time-consuming tasks and critical processes using robots, but they're also adding AI so their robots can handle more complex processes. How exactly does AI help the bank automate more and provide them with a competitive advantage? By enhancing their automations with AI, the bank can unleash their robots to do more, including the ability to enter Maria and Stefan's income, credit and other personal information using document understanding so no one has to do it manually. Decipher and process those thrilling documents like title deeds, thanks to natural language processing. Accurately convert and interpret handwritten home inspection notes. Utilize machine learning to analyze and predict whether the couple is likely to default on the loan. Allow the loan officers to check over and validate the robot's work for regulatory compliance. And with computer vision, the bank's automations can interact with every interface they encounter across the mortgage lifecycle, including loan origination systems. All of that makes a speedier and more efficient mortgage process, which can only mean good news for Maria and Stefan and their dream home. And should they ever have an application question, an AI-enabled chatbot is on hand to assist at any time and can provide updates on their application status. Looks like they're on track. Getting started on the journey to practical AI was easy for the bank, thanks to the starter models from UiPath. And these models are constantly learning and improving. What's more, AI is helping the bank to better understand its processes using their digital footprints, uncovering a constant flywheel of new automation opportunities. The match turned out perfectly. Superior AI Bank is constantly becoming more efficient, improving the speed of their revenue cycle and delivering a stellar customer experience. And Maria and Stefan were able to close on their loan in record time, securing their dream home. All thanks to UiPath AI.